In 1993, when I was 19, I did something really bold. I walked up to a boy at a crowded university dining hall, and I said, Hi, I'm Michelle, what's your name? Now, this was a pre-internet time, so I had to walk up to a table full of boys with all my pride aside and basically ask one of them, Do you like me? I've thought about this moment hundreds of times over the last 20 years, but lately these thoughts have taken on a different flavor. Lately, I've begun to wonder, how often in today's technological world do people really have to put their feelings on the line like this, where rejection would be so immediate and so palpable? 92% of young adults use social media, and more and more are turning to dating apps like Tinder, where you merely have to swipe right to find a date. And with virtually no risk, because if you swipe right and the other person doesn't, they don't even know you swipe them. When I walked up to that boy, it took courage, a fundamental human attribute. Where is that courage when you merely need to swipe right? And what effect is this having on a whole generation of digital natives? Going back to my story for a moment, my approaching a table full of 19-year-old boys did not go as well as I had hoped. The boy sitting across from him said, don't you know him? He's PC, he's a famous hockey player. Well, apparently he's not that famous, I said. <laughs> Gave a quick smile to PC and walked away thinking, oh, that couldn't have gone any worse. Nonetheless, three days later, PC, the famous hockey player, and I were officially an item. Everything I then learned about love, courtship, and sexuality, I learned at a time when people really had little black books. There were no mobile phones, and the internet was still something you dialed up and also in this unique arena of athletics, where the mate competition was fierce. For him, he had his adoring fans. And for me, he had 20 strapping teammates every year who were just my age and just my type. I remember the first time I felt this competition. A girl in my sorority, Abby, came up to me one Sunday morning and said she'd met my boyfriend at a party the night before. He's really cute, she said. Uh, yeah, yeah, he is. <laughs> My eyes narrowed. Because that's all I've got. I'm the daughter of two hippies, so that is pretty much my most aggressive move. <laughs> um, but this competition, I felt, is not unique to the world of athletics. Every one of you is surrounded by potential mating alternatives. And science says you're looking at them. More than 50 years ago, relationship researchers were looking into the reasons why people persist in relationships. The prevailing theory at the time was Kelly and Tebolt's interdependence theory that stated that dependence is based on two processes. Satisfaction, so how much is my partner meeting my most important needs? And quality of alternatives. How desirable is my best alternative to this relationship? Carol Rusbolt's investment model scale is probably the most widely used scale used today. And she added an additional dimension of investment or the resources tied to the relationship that would be lost if the relationship ended, like friends, relatives, connections. More investment leads to greater dependence, and this is related to higher commitment. Now, a commonality of both of these models is that we are continually evaluating the quality of the alternatives around us. The fundamental question is, is there in this world I exist in a better match for me? For those of us who are in highly satisfied and committed relationships, we tend to devalue those potential alternatives. But when satisfaction or investment falter, we might see more quality in the alternatives around us. So, when Abby came up to me and told me that my boyfriend was cute, I guess it was to be expected. She was a mating alternative, revealing herself to me in a mostly benign manner. And although I felt a pang of competition, I also thought, what is she going to do? Remember, this is 1993. Was she going to call my boyfriend on his landline and risk me answering or try to meet up with him face to face? No, of course not. 
because that would have been against the rules. Today's world is a totally new world. Not only the rules have changed, but it is an entirely new game. Mobile phones, social media sites like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, they have changed the game. Want to find your third grade girlfriend? She's probably on Facebook, like 71% of American adults. If not, Google her. It'll only take you a few seconds to find her. And what about the people you meet? Let's say you're out at a bar and you meet a friend of so and so, gathering little information about them except for their first name and where they work. Even with partial information, it is easy to make every sexual, romantic, social connection you have ever imagined. And then, every time you sit down with your computer or with your mobile phone, you have access to every person you have ever been attracted to in your entire life, plus those you have not yet met. Think about that for a moment. For the first time in human history. You have access to everyone. In other words, the internet is an easy place to find love, with a seemingly endless array of options. There's a really superb study out of Stanford by Michael Rosenfeld called the "How Couples Meet and Stay Together" study, and they found that there has been a drastic rise in couples meeting online since the late 1990s. In fact, one fifth of heterosexual couples and two thirds of the homosexual couples in their study, who met in 2010, met online. But recent research with this same data set by Aditi Paul has found that people who met online are more likely to break up, and they're also less likely to get married in the first place. Of the couples who met offline, two thirds got married. Of the couples who met online, Only one third got married, but why is this happening? Well, maybe when you hit a rough patch in your relationship, and you've already had success meeting a partner online, you think, "I'll be okay. I have approximately more or less millions of alternatives. I'll be fine." <laughs> and some of them I already know. They're in that little electronic black book that we all keep. You know your friends list. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, friends. The term is innocent enough, but could it be that hiding behind the guise of friendship on these various social media applications are people that you would sleep with or have a relationship with? Jason Dibble, Dan Miller, and I have been looking into this possibility. In our most recent study, we had people in committed relationships scroll through their Facebook friends list and count the number of people they would sleep with. Or have a relationship with if they were single. On average, women would have a relationship with three of their Facebook friends, and they would sleep with eight of them. <laughs> you think that's a lot? Men would have a relationship with eight of their Facebook friends, and they would sleep with 26 of them. <laughs> 26, and that was the average. Which means that some men said they would sleep with basically all of their Facebook friends. Now we also wondered, how many of these people are they keeping in contact with? You know, simmering on the back burner in case their current relationship failed. So, in a study we published in 2014, we defined the term back burner to a group of young adults. We told them that a back burner is someone you are romantically or sexually interested in. Who you're not in a current relationship with, but with whom you maintain contact, with the thought there might be some future romantic or sexual connection. Not surprisingly, young adults had a lot of these too. On average, women had four backburners. On average, men had eight. Now, most of them they communicated with in a platonic way, but some of them they communicated with in a romantic or sexual way. For women. On average, one they communicated with in a romantic or sexual way, and for men, on average, three. Now, these results weren't entirely surprising. Remember, the relationship theories say that we are continually evaluating the alternatives around us, but we were surprised to find that single people had no more backburners than people who were in committed relationships, and even more shockingly, it didn't matter how many backburners you had. 
or even the number you communicated with in a sexual or romantic way. This was unrelated to your investment in or commitment to your current partner. But wait a second. Didn't I just tell you the relationship theories say that if you are highly invested in your relationship and satisfied, you're supposed to devalue those alternatives? And wouldn't that make you less likely to keep in contact with them? Not necessarily. Today's technological landscape of communication makes it so easy for us to communicate with the people we are attracted to. And although we might begin that communication innocently, with no romantic designs, over the course of getting to know someone, you might begin to think, maybe I could see myself with this person someday in the future. And a backburner relationship is born. But why are we forming these relationships online? I keep referring to this as an easy process, but what scientific evidence do I have? Well, first, let's think about the asynchronous nature of the communication. Give most of us 20 minutes and Google, and I'm pretty sure we could pretend to be experts on just about anything. Then give us some time to craft a funny and witty message, and I'm pretty sure we'd all be quite charming. Anyone who reads knows that it is possible to fall in love with someone's words. So people chatting online might get really intimate really quickly. But why intimacy? Well, hovering right above safety on Maslow's hierarchy of needs is our need for love, belongingness, and intimacy. We want to share our lives with others, and we do this all the time online. Think of your Facebook newsfeed. It has all these little stories of people's lives, evidence that it is natural for us as humans to want to build connections with others and to have intimacy in our relationships. So, we have all this intimacy in our relationships, whether they're offline or online. But some researchers say that it is actually easier, perhaps, to do this online because the online environment enhances intimacy. Walther proposes that something called hyperpersonal communication occurs online, where we idealize the center of the message. We take time to craft messages that depict our best selves. And then we interpret messages in a way that serves to enhance intimacy in the relationship. So people chatting online can get really close really quickly. On the surface, this all doesn't sound so bad. The internet has lots of options for love and intimacy, and it seems easy to make these types of connections. So what's the problem? Well, one of the problems is, is that the internet is also a place that's ripe for deception. First, it is easy to lie about who you are online. In extreme cases like catfishing, highlighted in an MTV reality series, people could pose to be someone completely different than who they are. And this is more common than you think. Monica Witte found that many people, more than half in most cases, were lying in chat rooms about their age, their gender, their income, their occupation. And online daters, they're lying too. Research has found that many lie about their height, their weight, their romantic intentions, their interests, and some even use photos of other people. So, thinking back on it, it's probably not a big surprise that people who meet online are more likely to break up. Maybe sometimes the fantasy does not match the reality. But what about the social applications we all use? No one's lying on those, right? I mean, could someone really lie on Facebook? How often do you misrepresent yourself online? Maybe you don't lie about your age, but you probably don't post that picture where you're looking old, tired, and haggard. I don't. And maybe you don't lie about who you are, but when was the last time you posted anything about yourself that would cast you in an unfavorable light? Is this lying? Even a little bit? So I think we'd all agree that misrepresentation does, can occur online. But there's another avenue for deception, and that is that it is easy to cheat online. One only needs to think about the website Ashley Madison, the most famous name in infidelity and married dating, whose tagline is, life is short, have an affair, to know that the internet provides opportunities to cheat. 
But much of the cheating that goes on likely occurs outside of this organized arena via text messaging and the everyday social messaging applications that we all use with friends, backburners, innocent connections that turn into something more. One of the most disturbing statistics that I've heard recently is that Facebook has been cited in one third of the recent divorces in the United States. One third. So, any way you look at it, many of us are already playing this game of online love, but we don't even have a clear sense of the rules. We have rules for face to face cheating, scripts. We learn these rules from our parents, our past relationships, our cultures. So, if a man, Were to sneak off while his wife were sleeping in bed and to go meet a woman in a private place and they had sex, we probably all agree that's cheating. If he leaves his wife sleeping in bed and he goes and meets this woman and they both strip down and show each other their naked bodies, still many of us would consider this cheating. If he leaves his wife sleeping in bed, goes and meets this woman and they have a conversation and he shares his life, his feelings. His dreams. Still, many would consider this cheating. But what if that same man is sitting alone in his living room? What if the naked body he sees is in a picture? Or what if he's just sitting there chatting to a woman he finds attractive about his life, his feelings, his dreams? Now, is it cheating? Generally, the research on what constitutes infidelity shows that most, but not all, people. Believe that emotional infidelity, the most innocent of the scenarios, is betrayal. Whether face to face or online, there is secrecy, trust has been broken, and time has been invested in someone other than one's partner. Most times, these issues of betrayal are addressed after the fact, after a partner has already found out about the online relationship. So, marital therapists are encouraging people to develop new scripts proactively. Then include what they will and will not accept in terms of online behavior. So, what are the rules of online love in your relationship? Do you share passwords? Does your partner have full access to your phone? Can you befriend your ex on social media? What about the people you find attractive? Can you have an intimate relationship with someone online, provided you never intend to meet them? I've devoted much of my recent life to studying in this area, and even I don't have a clear sense of the rules. But this is what I do know. The world has changed a lot since the day I approached that boy in the dining hall. I married that famous hockey player. That's right. And we have two young sons. And just like the rest of you, we are trying to navigate our way through this new world of cell phones and internet and social media, where the mate competition is everybody. So much so that as I was rehearsing this talk, he turned to me and asked, So what are our rules? I don't know, babe, but like it or not, we, all of us, were already in the game. Thank you.